welcome everyone. It's so good to see you today. And um, Lydia and Michael wanted me to explain some of the powerful symbolisms in the wedding today. And so it's my honor as the father of the bride to do so. You are in a labyrinth. Now, it is not a maze. A maze tricks you. A maze has different routes that lead you to a dead end. On the other hand, a labyrinth is one pathway to a center. That center is the Lord Jesus Christ. That pathway is the Lord Jesus Christ. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And that's the gospel in one essence. You know, even though the word labyrinth is not in the Bible, Christians, by the time of 325, had started to incorporate the labyrinth as a part of their contemplation of the Holy Scriptures. And then uh, the Gothic churches in Europe, you can go to Europe today and you will find many labyrinths that are beside the church. In fact, uh, in those early days, uh, Christians were expected to make a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, but not everyone could because of the cost and lack of transportation. And so they would use a labyrinth then to symbolize their pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So the theme of following God's way as one seeks the kingdom of God first, and that was central to the teachings of Jesus Christ, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And so the labyrinth is a spiritual symbol of a person's spiritual journey as they seek to glorify God and enjoy his presence. And another way of thinking about this is that as Lydia and Michael separately uh, come through the labyrinth, they have been praying, which I hope they've been praying ever since they came into union with Christ Jesus, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. And as one travels the labyrinth, they pray, God, my Father, Thy will be done in my life. And so as they come to an end of their single life, that journey, they come to the center and to be united as husband and wife. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. Now the other symbolism is the wedding vase. Some might say vase, but us southerners we say vase. Now Michael and Lydia will be using the wedding vase as they take communion. One spout on the wedding vase represents the husband, and the other one, obviously, the wife. And the handle in the middle of a wedding vase represents the unity that a husband and wife will achieve when they come together on their wedding day. And if you notice the vase, the space between the handle and the two, two spouts is a representation of the couple's life. Each takes a turn drinking from the wedding vase. The groom starts by offering the vase to his wife, and she takes a sip from it. And then the bride turns the vase and offers it back to the groom so he can sip out of it. And once the wedding ceremony is over, the wedding vase becomes a representation of the couple's foundational love together. So when you visit Michael and Lydia in their home at 144 Harvest Drive, Steinbeck, Manitoba, Canada, in the, in the world and the universe, you might see that vase. Now, the last symbolism, which is of great power and dearly, dear to our hearts as imperfect followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the Lord's Supper. And um, I think, you know, looking at you, most of you know what this means, but I just want you to take the words of what St. Paul, was it St. Paul? No, well, Jesus, maybe. Remember. And so let me just read these really quickly as I jotted them down the other night. We remember God's love for us as sinners. We remember our need for a Savior as we cannot work our way to heaven. We remember that Jesus lived the perfect life we cannot live. We remember that salvation is by grace alone, by faith alone, and in Christ alone. We remember that he gave his life, his body as a sacrifice on the cross, as a penal substitute for us. We remember that nothing can wash our sins away. <laughs> but the blood of Jesus, our Passover lamb. We remember that Jesus beat the hell out of death. And you probably never heard that before, but I use that phrase in my mother's funeral. Jesus beat the hell out of death through the resurrection. That's just beautiful. I hope you can <laughs> enjoy that with me. And then finally, we remember how great the love of the Father is in that God demonstrated his own love towards us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So on this day, June 26, 2021, may you find the symbolism in Michael and Lydia's wedding ceremony moving your hearts and minds towards the living God. He is with us today.
pray to God, for God is love. Love is our way to God, for God is love. The wilderness road of shame is gone. The desert road of dislocation gone. The stony road of loneliness has now. To me, 
go ahead and correct me for the sake of your name It's not much of a threat, but my hoping is keeping me sane Again and again in your love, remember me In your love, remember me All because of your goodness, Lord, in your love, remember
tell a story if my life would sing a song if I have a testimony if I have anything at all no one ever cared for me like Jesus his faithful hand has held me all this way and when I'm old and gray and all my days are numbered on the earth let it be known in you alone my joy is found let my children tell the children let this be their memory All my treasure was in heaven, and you were everything to me. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. His faithful hand has held me all this way. Old and gray, and all my days are numbered on the earth. Let it be known in you alone. My joy was found. may be seated. I'll ask the parents to remain standing with uh, the bride and the groom. The rest of us may sit down. Just a word about what follows. Um, we're leading up to where the parents release their child, so to speak, uh, because a new family is being formed. We'll come to that in a moment. But just a word about 
Christian marriage. Dear friends, we are assembled here in the presence of God to join this man and this woman in holy marriage, which is instituted by God, regulated by his commands, blessed by our Lord Jesus Christ, and to be held in honor among all people. Let us therefore reverently remember that God has established and sanctified marriage for the welfare and happiness of humankind. Our Savior has declared that a man shall leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. By his apostles, he has instructed those who enter into this relation to cherish a mutual esteem and love, to bear with each other's infirmities and weaknesses, to comfort each other in sickness, trouble, and sorrow, in honesty and industry, to provide for each other and for their household in temporal things, to pray for and encourage each other in the things that pertain to God, and to live together as heirs of the grace of life. Michael Dweck and Lydia Somerville, as you come to this altar before God, you have purposed to enter into Christian marriage. Christian marriage is unique. In commitment to God, you become one. In commitment to each other, this oneness is worked out through a lifetime. In Christian marriage, there is from here no looking back, no looking around. In Christ and in the fellowship of his body, the Church, there is grace, wisdom, and support for you to grow and mature in life together in ever-deepening dimensions. Each of you brings to your marriage the gifts and endowments of your personalities, sex, and roles. May these complement one another in the enrichment of you, you, you both. Ways to give of yourselves to each other, not to get. Accept and cherish each other's gifts and talents as from the Lord. Keep the channels of communication open between you. For these are the avenues of joy and growth. Let not any day end with a wall standing between you. A good and blessed marriage does not just happen. It is made. Like a tender plant, a marriage grows strong when it is cultivated and nurtured with tender care and visible loving acts. Continually give yourselves to God and to each other so shall your lives be rich together. The joys will be magnified, the sorrows modified, and the burdens made bearable. As Michael and Lydia come now to this place to be united in marriage, let us call together upon God for guidance and blessing. Pray with me. Our Father in heaven, Lord of our lives today, we are assured that where two or three are gathered in Jesus' name, there he is among them. Grace this occasion with a sense of your presence, so that the words we say and the covenants we here declare may be under your lordship. We worship you as we enter upon these responsible acts. In Jesus' name, amen. This may sound to some of you as though it's actually the wedding vow. It isn't. This is just asking them now, are you serious? You really want to do this? Michael Dueck, will you take Lydia Somerville to be your wedded wife, to cherish her and live with her according to God's holy ordinance? Will you pledge your loyalty to her and promise to love, honor, and comfort and keep her in health and in sickness, in prosperity and adversity, and keep yourself unto her only so long as you both shall live? If so, answer, I will. I will. Lydia Somerville, will you take Michael Dweck to be your wedded husband, to cherish him and live with him according to God's holy ordinance? Will you pledge your loyalty to him and promise to love, honor, comfort, and keep him in health and in sickness, in prosperity and adversity, and keep yourself unto him only so long as you both shall live? If so, answer, I will. I will.
So we come to what has sometimes been called the giving of the bride, but in fact, both families are giving up being the place that their child has found his or her first identity. So I'm asking the question first of uh, the, the bride and then of the groom. Uh, who brings this woman to be united to this man in marriage? To the glory of God, her mother and I do. Who brings this man to be wedded to this woman? We do. We do. So now, Lydia, you can move from one man to another in your life. That is actually a bittersweet moment always for both sets of parents, and extremely important. We will be singing uh, two congregational songs. The lyrics are being distributed here, and I invite you to sit or to stand as we praise our Lord together, however you are comfortable. We will start with singing, My Savior's Love. Amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene And wonder how he could love me A sinner condemned unclean Let's sing that verse one again I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene How he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous! Oh, how wonderful! And my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous! Oh, how wonderful is my Savior! For me, He took my sins and my sorrows. He made them His very own. He bore the burden to Calvary and suffered and died alone. Marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. When with the ransomed in glory, his face. I at last shall see it will be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me oh how marvelous oh how wonderful and my song shall ever be oh how marvelous, oh how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Let's sing my Savior's love. And oh how marvelous, oh how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. Oh how marvelous, oh Wonderful is my Savior's love for me.
We will also be singing the song Wings of an Eagle, and it's beside if you're following along on your sheets. We will not grow weary, we will not grow faint On the wings of an eagle we will rise As we hope in the Lord, we will gain our strength We will run for miles, we will stand up straight We will not grow weary, we will not grow faint On the wings of an eagle we will rise on the wings of an eagle we will rise On the wings of an eagle we will rise For our hope is found in the power of God On the wings of an eagle we will rise On the wings of an eagle we will rise For the Lord who is God calls His people home not to be afraid as we journey the road hand in hand we'll be walking with the lord our god on the wings of an eagle we will rise as we hope as we hope in the lord we will gain our strength we will run for miles we will stand up straight we will not go weary we will not go on the wings of an eagle we will rise On the wings of an eagle we will rise On the wings of an eagle we will rise For our hope is found in the power of God On the wings of an eagle we will rise On the wings of an eagle we will rise Let's sing that chorus again, on the wings. On the wings of an eagle we will rise. On the wings of an eagle we will rise. For our hope is found in the power of God. On the wings of an eagle we will rise. On the wings of an eagle we will rise. On the wings of an eagle we will rise. Will rise on the wings of an eagle. We will rise. You know that a wedding is a sacrament. Uh, sacrament isn't quite the language that I grew up with. I talk about ordinances based on my theological background, my church background. But we can call a marriage the marriage sac sacrament, the wedding sacrament. And we're having the, uh, the Lord's table, the communion service, the Eucharist, which is also a sacrament. The spoken word is the sacrament of the word. These are all means of grace by which God comes to us. So hear what God has laid on my heart. As Michael and Lydia sat with Lois and me before the wedding, I asked what passage of scripture they might want me to speak on. They gave me a wonderful selection. Hosea chapter 2, which they will read shortly, reminds us of the way that God's love creates acceptance and identity in the emptiness of human rejection and failures. The letters of John, including 1 John chapter 4, have the constant theme of God's love. Love defines God. We read that God is love. And God's love defines us. Ephesians 4 locates the source of our love and unity within the work of God's Holy Spirit in our lives. Psalm 25, so important in Michael's own journey. And Psalm 116 
remind us that we find God's love and care when we come to the end of our own resources. These are good passages. Read them often. Read them well. As I read the passages myself, I decided to do something other than work through the scripture of any one of these. Rather, I want to reflect on a thread that ties them together. The thread that ties these passages together is the meaning of love, God's love for us and our love for each other. Marriage is more than love, of course. Marriage includes as its lifeblood promises made and promises kept. At one level, the idea of promise is the essence. It's the basic thing, one of the basic things going on. Uh, we talked as we sat together about compatibility and how personalities come to, and so on. And you know, commitment matters more than compatibility. That you make a promise today and you keep your promise. That is at the heart. But, uh, so marriage, there's much more than marriage, of course. Uh, marriage grows and changes over the years. Sometimes marriage is full of fun and frolic. Sometimes it is held together by a stubborn commitment not to give up. But love is the heart of marriage. Love is the essence of human life as God's images. So I want to talk a bit about love. I come from the 60s. And when I was young, the Beatles sang, All You Need Is Love. I remember spending the summer of 1969 working and living in San Francisco, the city of love. That was the summer of love in the city of love. And we would have been singing the Beatles songs at that time. A little over 50 years ago, Lennon and McCartney wrote this song. And they were right, of course. All you need is love. But I don't think that the kind of love they had in mind is nearly enough. Love is all you need only if we have some idea of what it is. To many people today in North America, love is reduced to the attraction we feel between the sexes. But of course, love is much more than that. I suspect that many of you know that the Greek language used in the New Testament has four words for love. Only two of them appear in the New Testament, but we often talk about the four loves. And uh, I went back and read C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves, in preparation for this. Uh, in many ways, Lewis's understanding of Scripture helps me uh, almost as much as Scripture. Uh, English, we just have the word love. You can add other similar words like adore and like and uh, I read once that somebody tried to use the word I dote on you as a way of saying I love you well. Okay. Um, but Greek has these four words that we all translate as love when we find them in Greek literature. The first, and th these four words make a useful tool to expl explore a, a fuller meaning of love than the Beatles may have understood. The first is storge, affection, family love, Family love is the affection that we feel for those people who, who we're related to, like it or not. Sometimes we say you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. We may fight with those we love as family, but let someone from outside attack us and we bond together. We are family. Now there's something divine in this kind of love. Loving the other person even when they annoy you or hurt you. This love is important enough that Jesus showed it you don't find the word in the New Testament, but you find the love itself. Jesus showed it as he hung on the cross. You remember the scene as he was dying. He looks down at Mary and at his beloved disciple John, and he said, uh, Mother, Mary, behold your son. John, behold your mother, providing for his mother with his last breath. In his own extremity, Jesus reached out to take care of his mother. But family love also has its dark side. Sometimes it sets itself up as the ultimate authority in our lives. You may remember another moment in the Gospels when Jesus' own family tried to take him from his ministry. They came. They said, uh, he might be crazy. He needs help. We need a psychiatrist, maybe, a, maybe an exorcist. And Jesus, at that moment, turned from his family and declared that the family of God was his true family. Who is my mother or brother or sisters? Those who do the will of God. The second word for love is philia, friendship. You can't choose your family, true. But we do choose our friends. Friends are bound together by shared interests. I love the game of chess. 
and I have observed that when I find another chess player, it is easy to become friends. Notably, one of the words that Jesus used for the disciples was to call them his friends. And we have that in the song, in the hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus. As with Storge, there is something divine about philia, about friendship. We come together with those who share our interests, and we're bound together in something that resembles the love that Jesus had for his disciples. There's another reason that friendship is incredibly important. Sometimes in North America, we think that our spouse must be everything to us. We capture it in the way that we say my husband or my wife is my best friend. Well, it's wonderful when that happens, but it doesn't always happen, and it isn't even necessary that it happens. It is necessary that you have friends, and it's good if you get to like each other as well as love each other. But you need other people. You need your friends. You need the people who've walked with you to this place. You need them after you leave this place as your friends. No human relationship can bear the burden of being everything to us. To have a healthy relationship with your spouse, we need each other people. We need other people outside the relationship to share interests in life with. We need friends. But friendship also has its dark side. When people bond with each other around a demonic interest, as the Nazis did in the 1930s and 40s, the friendships they form are not good. Bad friends are all the worse, because friendship itself is so important. The third word we look at is well known, eros, or physical attraction. Eros brings sparkle and joy to the marriage relationship. This committed relationship provides a safe place for Eros to shine. This form of love is, of course, what I suspect the Beatles were thinking about in their song, All You Need Is Love. Uh, Stephen St Stills of uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Stephen Stills expressed a similar thought in 1970 with the song, If you can't be with the one you love, honey, love the one you're with. A Christian view of Eros emphasizes instead the place of sexual love within the marriage covenant. And in its place, Eros is wonderful. Eros, Eros is so wonderful that it is actually one of the gods in the Greek pantheon. Eros is a god like Jupiter, like, well, except that's Latin, not Greek, uh, Zeus in Greek. Uh, Eros is a god. But like the other forms of love, eros has its dark side. When sexual love becomes the be-all and end-all of life, it becomes destructive of marriage, it becomes destructive of life itself. You see a common theme in the first three forms of love. They each reflect something of divinity. They each bring us closer to each other and to God. And they each have their dark side. When they try to take God's place, they each become God's enemy. All of this brings us to the fourth word for love, the word that is used when John says, God is love. Uh, John doesn't say God is any of these other words. God, he says, God is agape. God is love. This is the New Testament's favorite word for love. It's a uniquely Christian use of the word. This is the love that Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 13. This is distinctively Christian love. Agape differs from the first three words. Storge, philia, and eros each try to take God's place. Agape lives within God as the essence of God's nature. Storge, philia, and eros each show themselves as a matter of emotions and feeling. Agape is primarily a choice, a matter of the will. You set your will. That's why you make promises today. You're not promising to feel the way you feel now. You can't do that. You can set your will. You can promise to do something. The first three, Storge, Philia, and Eros, give of themselves, but they also ask for something in return. C.S. Lewis calls them need love. All you need is love? Well, they're talking about needing love and, and love that needs the other person. Agape gives itself completely for the good of the other and asks for nothing in return. Agape is gift love. God is agape. 
What sort of love is this? Many years ago, a friend of mine described it as wanting God's best for the other person. You want God's best for the other person. Whether that best is pleasant or unpleasant in the moment is not at issue. You want the best. You want what God wants. When we say that God loves us, we know that means that God wants the very best for us. But often when we say, I love you, we mean simply, I need you and I need what you give to me. Remember another song from my generation, uh, and I want you more than need you, and I need you for all time, Glenn Campbell. And Yeah, that's eros, but that's not agape. Agape may, you may still feel, because none of the other three are bad, so you feel them, but you make agape the foundation. In fact, we are made to need each other and to need what the other gives. It's the way God has made us. It's good, but it's good when agape is at the center. Agape then reflects God's heart for the other person. It brings us closer to each other, and it brings us closer to God. When you are filled with this God love, all other forms of love become good and beautiful. And Eros and Philia and Storge become almost divine themselves, ruled by agape flowing from the heart of God. What does this mean in practical terms? Well, your homework assignment is to figure that out over the rest of your lives. But I'll say just this much today. It's good that you have warm feelings about each other. It's good that you feel deep affection for each other. It's good that you share interests and values. But none of these is enough to build your lives on. Build your lives on God. Build your lives on God's love, which works in you for God's best in you. Desire God's best for each other. Choose God. Choose what is good. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Build the foundation of your lives with God's perfect love, which sanctifies and celebrates all other forms of love. You know, of course, how God's love shows itself for us. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love, agape, becomes most visible on the cross. And your love for each other will grow and develop and become what God wants when it begins with your own embrace of the cross. And when it founders and you have trouble and you can't figure out what to do next, which will happen, you come back to the cross. That's where you start. You'll have to work out what that means. Giving yourself for each other, caring more about each other's needs than your own, seeking God's best for each other at all times. If you do this, if you bring yourself and your marriage to the foot of the cross, God's love will flow through you in good times and in bad times. May God bless you and your marriage from this day forward and forever. Amen. We have the reading of two of the scriptures that were uh, in the background. And I wanted to reflect on love first so that as you hear the scripture read, you are listening for the note of love and thinking especially of God's love as we've been thinking of it. The first, well, I don't know which is first. I don't know which of you will read first. I think Michael will read first. Michael will read from Hosea chapter 2. And a passage that Lydia found especially helpful in her journey through their relationship. And then Lydia will read Psalm 25, a passage that Michael found helpful in the journey through their relationship. Hosea chapter 2, verses 14 to 23. In the scripture, it's titled, The Lord's Love for Unfaithful Israel starting at verse 14 of chapter 2, Hosea. 
but then I will win her back once again. I will lead her into the desert and speak tenderly to her there. I will return her vineyards to her and transform the valley of trouble into a gateway of hope. She will give herself to me there, as she did long ago when she was young, when I freed her from captivity in Egypt. When that day comes, says the Lord, you will call me my husband instead of my master. O Israel, I will wipe the many names of Baal from your lips, and you will never mention them again. On that day, I will make a covenant with all the wild animals and the birds of the sky and the animals that scurry along the ground, so they will not harm you. I will remove all weapons of war from the land, all swords and bows, so you can live unafraid in peace and safety. I will make you my wife forever, showing you righteousness and justice, unfailing love and compassion. I will be faithful to you and make you mine, and you will finally know me as the Lord. In that day I will answer, says the Lord. I will answer the sky as it pleads for clouds, and the sky will answer the earth with rain. Then the earth will answer the thirsty cries of the grain, the grapevines, and the olive trees, and they in turn will answer, Jezreel, God plants. At that time, I will plant a crop of Israelites and raise them for myself. I will show love to those I called not loved, and to those I called not my people. I will say, now you are my people. And they will reply, you are our God. The word of the Lord. Psalm 25. In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame or let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come upon those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your path. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my rebellious ways, but according to your love, remember me. For you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, Lord, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity, and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. Look on my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how numerous are my enemies and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me. Because my hope, Lord, is in you. Deliver Israel, O God, from all their troubles. This is the word of the Lord. We have two sets of vows. 
uh, there is one that each the the bride and the groom have each written their own vow that they want to make to the other. And then we are taking what we might call the traditional vows. Um, another way of saying it is that which has been tested, tried, thought through in many different ways and situations. Uh, so we'll begin in each case with the custom vow and then with the traditional vow and with the uh, giving of the rings. I enjoy improvisation. I enjoy extemporizing. That doesn't mean that I'm all that good at it. And so out of love for Lydia, I've chosen to write out my vows and I will speak them for a limited amount of time so that we can all enjoy the rest of the ceremony. I speak to Lydia, but this is partly intended for you to hear some of our story as well. You may sit down. Thanks be to God. I couldn't have imagined anyone like Lydia coming along in my life. That's the kind of phrase that I would use with people who saw us together back in those early years of 2015, 2016. By saying that, I could have meant that I had this long and beautiful list of qualities, characteristics, and conditions that I expected my future spouse to fulfill in one personality. But I knew that wasn't the reason. Because even though I knew that there were things I wanted to see in a spouse, someone who loved Jesus more than anything or anyone, yet was still kind and generous to others, someone who made me laugh and that I could make laugh, someone who challenged me and who I could challenge, this was only a start. I didn't know the half of all the things I wanted in a wife, never mind could imagine a wife being for someone. In meeting you and beginning a relationship with you, my mind was going to be regularly blown, just as this paper is, regularly blown over and over as you shattered every expectation. I came to learn that I couldn't have imagined anyone like you because I didn't have the capacity to imagine that there existed in this world a person with the characteristics and qualities that you possess. I didn't realize there existed a person who loved Jesus as much as you do, acknowledged and celebrated others as intensely, cared for animals and creation so passionately, worked as hard on self-improvement and growth, enjoyed silence and solitude as much, cracked as many darkly humorous jokes, was so creative in her expression from food to clothing to party decor, was refreshed from being in nature so thoroughly and I could go on and on. Lydia, your skills, abilities, and passions seem to have no limit, and I am in awe. I am in awe of what you are all interested in and all the things you ultimately prove you are good at. But these qualities are not so unique in and of themselves. Neither is this particular collection of qualities all that unique. I'm sure others possess this same list, but none will do so with the language, energy, intensity, and excitement for life that you possess. And yet these are not the reasons why I find myself in front of you today. In the early days of our relationship, I found myself drawn to you because you were a fascinating specimen. Who is that woman? But I found myself staying drawn to you because of how you made me feel. The spirit was immediately at work within me through you and how you made me feel. I realized that I wanted someone who was strong and courageous, yet humble and full of grace. I realized that I wanted someone who would challenge my faith and encourage 
it to grow deeper beyond whatever righteousness I thought I had attained already, and even in the face of whatever righteousness that I could even attain. I realized that I wanted someone to expand my world, my attitudes, beliefs, and understandings of who the Holy Spirit was and how he worked on this earth. I realized that I didn't just want these things. I needed them. I didn't know how much I needed them. I didn't know how much work that had to be done in me in order to make me ready for such a person. And the Lord worked on my heart something fierce throughout our relationship and most certainly through our time apart to clean up house and make me a better recipient of the love that he was showing through you. So today I speak out my desire and commitment to respond in kind to many of the same gifts that you regularly give me and also to communicate love in ways that only he is able to work within me for you. With the Lord's help, I promise to help you feel as safe as you make me feel. I promise to bring you to Jesus and his throne of grace and peace, both in your times of joy and especially in moments of anxiety. And I promise to help you remember how shoulds and shame have no place in your life and are your enemies. With the Lord's help, I promise to encourage you with words that will uplift and help you realize a potential that even you do not realize. With the Lord's help, I will be your helpmate, your partner in all things from meals to landscaping to child rearing to investing and preserving our marriage bed. With the Lord's help, I will hear your heart first on things that bother you and empathize with you before letting the things that may be triggered within me take over. With the Lord's help, I promise to keep at your side in ministry, supporting you in your work, whether it be as a spiritual care provider or as a missionary or as a hospitable host or as a music minister. With the Lord's help, I promise to sing serious songs, songs about Jesus, and silly songs, with the occasional Broadway-inspired improvisation from time to time. With the Lord's help, I promise to engage your whimsical side and enjoy the lighter things of life, being ridiculous and laughing easily at things. With the Lord's help, I promise to take my role as spiritual leader soberly and with great humility as the Lord works in me to guide our home in righteousness. With the Lord's help, I promise to make our home as safe and enjoyable a place to be as possible, where the stresses and responsibilities of your work do not have to be upheld in the same way, and you can remember what it is to just be Lydia, without any other titles and obligations attached. With the Lord's help, I promise to provide for you, to receive from you, to honor you above anyone else on this planet, and to cherish you. I know you want to be beheld and cherished tenderly. A flower so beautiful deserves to be beheld and cherished tenderly. And I desire to behold you every day with utter awe and wonder and respond in a way that lets you know I see you and I choose you. Lydia, you fit me the best. You are the one the Lord has preserved for me. For me. You are my gift. And I promise to choose you. 
today, tomorrow, and for the rest of our lives. Michael, would you take Lydia's hands? So repeat after me. Michael Dueck, will you take the hand of your bride and repeat after me this Solomon Covenant? I, Michael Dueck, take you, Lydia Somerville, to be my wedded wife. I, Michael Dueck, will take you, Lydia Somerville, to be my wedded wife. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death us do part. According to God's holy ordinance. According to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I pledge you my faith. And thereto I pledge you my faith. So something that Michael doesn't know is that I worked on my vows for uh, four weeks. And then three days ago they got deleted and erased. So <laughs> I've been working on them again and trying to remember them what I wrote. So I know in my heart what the original ones were, but here are the ones today. My darling Michael, I stand here today in awe and wonder over the miracle how God has brought us so far in life. My heart cannot express the joy I have every time I think of his wondrous mercy over us. I could have never imagined six years ago that I would be standing here with you today, committing my life before God, family and friends, to be your betrothed, <laughs> your partner and your wife. In 2019, I thought I had lost you. And yet God, being great in mercy and love, revealed his heart to me and restored us. <laughs> he has revealed himself through you and through your tender patience and gentle compassion. God heard my prayers and returned us to one another. He has preserved you for me and I for you in body and mind and spirit and has given us a second and third and fourth chance to join him hand in hand. This journey has been hard and I know that there will be more difficult times, but I also believe God continues to help us, to help me to trust him more through my relationship with you. You are patient to a fault, kind and gentle with your words, generous as you are able, and the Lord continues to show himself to me through you daily. The Lord alone has made this beautiful and precious day possible. Therefore, I trust and I promise with Jesus to grow in trusting you because I know I'm not very good at it. But I promise to cling to the Lord for my security. I promise with Jesus to hold your heart safe and to treat it with the must utmost respect. I choose with the Holy Spirit to look to your interests just as much as I look to mine. 
I choose to offer you my heart of delight, creativity and whimsy as I make our house a home, our meals a cultural buffet, and our closets a death trap filled with way too many clothes. I choose to offer to combine my efficiency, my work ethic, and my multitasking still skills to your methodical, restful, and reflective way of life. Thank you for helping me to slow down with the hope that we will not drive each other mad. <laughs> I vow to wake up way too early every morning, tickle you way too often every night, become way too grumpy every day, and kiss you every chance I get. I commit with the help of the Heavenly Father to sharing our gifts, talents, and resources with others while also keeping the most sacred parts of ourselves for each other only. I promise to always have way too many green things growing in the house and an obsession with plants and trees and forests and a desire to see everything grow, including you. I vow to keep my eyes on Jesus, respecting myself, my body, my mind, and my spirit, and to do good self-care so I can give out of abundance back to you and not out of lack. I promise with Jesus' guidance to be encouraging while also honest with you and straightforward so that we can both continue to be teachable and humble and safe in each other's presence. I vow to be generous in spirit, generous with our resources, and to always make our home a safe place for others who have nothing. I promise to remain teachable even when it hurts to allow Jesus to rid me of my defensiveness and to help me to always think the best before the worst whenever we have an argument. And I vow to always have way too many celebrations, celebrate way too many birthdays, find every ridiculous way to shoot confetti at every event, and to celebrate all your family's birthdays. Above all, I vow to keep my eyes on Jesus. I to remember that he is the perfecter of my faith and your faith. To remember my cultural roots and to embrace yours and make them my own. I remember to keep on going with Jesus' help, even when you can't. I promise to love Jesus first above all others, knowing he will help me to love you every day. I promise to keep you accountable to these three. And I ask that you would keep me accountable. I love you. You can take your groom's hands. So repeat after me. I, Lydia Somerville, take you, Michael Dueck, to be my wedded husband. I, Lydia Somerville, take you, Michael Dueck, to be my wedded husband. To have and to hold from this day forward. To have and to hold from this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to, ch to cherish. To love and to cherish. Till death us do part. Till death do us part. According to God's holy ordinance. According to God's holy ordinance. And thereto I pledge you my faith. And thereto I pledge you my faith. What token, Michael, do you bring as a pledge that you will faithfully perform these vows? This ring. Let this ring be the sacred symbol of your abiding love. You may place... And 
Lydia, what, what token do you bring as a pledge that you will faithfully perform these vows? This ring. Let this ring be the sacred symbol of your abiding love. We'll move into a time of communion. Just by the way, it just struck me, I've never noticed it before, that in the um, giving of the ring, I have the ring with which Lois and I did the same thing, what was that, 44 years ago next month. And I've always thought of this ring as a symbol of my love for Lois. That's not what they said. You gave it to him. That ring that you're wearing is a symbol of Lydia's love. And that ring that you're wearing is a symbol of Michael's love. So, just uh, something I had not observed before. As we said earlier, there are three sacraments here, the marriage sacrament, the sacrament of the Word, and now the sacrament of the Lord's table. Uh, Michael and Lydia will distribute the elements first before we, uh, b before we take them, and I will just explain as we do, as they do so, uh, what will happen. Um, first, they will, as uh, Chris explained, they will use the Apache vase. I'm not from the South. <laughs> uh, I'm from an English country, Zimbabwe. So that's the way. That's the way it will be. Um, and they will take communion first. I will use the words of the institution of the bread and the cup as I have known them in my own background as an ordained minister in the Brethren in Christ Church. Um, I'll use one set of words and prayers for both bread and cup, and then um, they, Michael and Lydia will take following that, and then all of us will take together. Know that symbols mean what we decide they mean. That's what was going on. With, that's what was going on at that first meal because uh, they had bread and wine as a part of the regular meal. That's all it was. It was just the ordinary stuff that they had. So you're, getting, you're not getting the bread right now. You're just getting a cup. I will say the words of the bread and the cup because they are the words that are in Scripture. But then the cup that you're getting is not the wine that they had in Jesus' day. They weren't quite as hung up about alcohol as we were as we are. Uh, you're getting pomegranate juice. <laughs> but it means what symbols mean. Symbols mean what we think, what we decide on together, what we covenant together for them to mean. Um, and these mean the body and blood of Christ. That's what's going on. What you have done in any communion service, you remember the Lord's death till Jesus returns. So I'm going to invite all of us to stand. We now invite you to come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Come to testify not that you are perfect, but that you sincerely love our Lord Jesus and desire to be his true disciple. Come not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Not because you have any claim on heaven's rewards, but because in your frailty you stand in constant need of heaven's mercy and help. Now that the supper of the Lord is spread before you, lift up your minds and hearts above all selfish fears and cares. 
let this bread and this cup be to you the witness of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples. We follow his example. The words that we use as a congregation in my growing up is, friends, is this, not, is this bread not the communion of the body of Christ? And everyone replies, this bread is the communion of the body of Christ. And then we eat the bread remembering that he was born for our Savior that he was born to be our Savior. He was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. Feed on him in your heart and be thankful. And on the night when Jesus was betrayed, he also took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples. We do likewise. Let's pray together for the bread and the cup. Our God, we thank you for giving yourself in the person of Jesus Christ, your body, and your blood, your body broken for us for forgiveness of our sins. We are so weak, completely unworthy to ever come into your presence, and you make us worthy. Thank you for your blood shed for us to cleanse us. It's an image we hardly understand anymore, the cleansing power of the blood. Blood is not a pleasant image for us, and yet blood is life. And you give us life, and we thank you. Bless this cup that we drink, and in it the bread that we eat, your body and your blood, broken and shed for us. Bless it, we pray, in your holy name. Amen. Take the cup, remembering that Jesus said, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it together and be thankful. We want to do a blessing now. Um, This is a blessing from the Orthodox tradition. Uh, it is one that I am less familiar with, but I understand that uh, Lyndon will be behind Michael. Okay. And is it Sarah behind Lydia? And they will be wreathed, so to speak. Uh, the wreath is not the victor's wreath, although that would be an image one could think of as if they were at the end of an arduous race, but it reminds us of the cross and the wreath that Jesus wore. They mocked him with a crown of thorns, and it has become a wreath of greater victory than ever, ever won in a race. I want to give to them my own blessings, my own words of blessing. The ancient Jewish prayer. You may have heard it. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe. It begins every Jewish prayer. When they drink the cup, as they did at the Last Supper, they begin. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, the giver of the gift of the vine. Our blessing is based on the blessing we receive is based on the blessing that we give to God, who is the source of all blessings. From God, then, flows this blessing. May you, Michael and Lydia, 
each day of your lives, seek to know God better, seek to love God more fully, and seek to follow God more nearly. Then you will live to the full the lives that God desires for you, that are perfect in God's agape love, and so come at the end to adore and praise God with all God's saints in heaven forever. You can place the wreaths on their head. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. you and keep you make his face shine upon you be gracious to you Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace I invite the congregation to sing along the Lord bless you shine upon you, be gracious to you, the Lord turn his face toward you, and give peace, oh, amen, amen, amen. shine upon you, be gracious to you, the Lord turn his face toward you. Sing on and again. And your family, and your children, and your children, and your children, may His favor be upon you, and a thousand generations, and your family, and your children, and your children, and your children, may His favor be upon you, and a thousand generations, and your family, and your children. Children and your children, may his favor be upon you in a thousand generations, and your family and your children.
children and your children and your children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming and your going in your weeping and rejoicing he is for you he is for you he is for you, 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 He is for you. be upon you in a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and your children may his presence go before you and behind you and beside you all around you and within you he is with you he is with you in the morning in the evening in your coming in your going, in your weeping and rejoicing, he is for you, 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 he is for you. possible sometimes to forget what I said some time ago. This is at its essence a covenant 
a promise made and a promise kept. And we are the witnesses to this promise, so that as we come to the end, I remind you that when I say I pronounce you husband and wife, we're just holding them to the promise they've made. After we've had the recessional and we're walking out, you remember that on the way back there are various things that were described for you and you can stop for pictures, etc. Michael Dueck and Lydia Somerville, you can join your hands. It says here, join your right hands, but I'm going to take it as you've done it. So Michael and Lydia, you may join your hands, and I will ask you to put your hands together in the center, and I will put my hands with yours. Yes. For as much as Michael Dueck and Lydia Somerville have consented together in holy marriage and have declared the same before God and in the presence of this company, by the authority vested in me as a minister of the gospel, I pronounce them husband and wife in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What God has joined together, let no one put asunder. You may greet each other with a kiss. Now we present to you for the first time Mr. and Mrs. Somerville Dueck.